there was a case study for connectivity. I wanted to talk about TNC's terrestrial resilience tools today um, and visit some of the methods that they use to, de to develop these. Here's the link to get to TNC's Conservation Gateway, and I'd love for you guys to spend some time playing with these tools in, um, in areas that you are familiar with to actually think about um, how they have, have applied some of these concepts of connectivity that we've talked about today and the landscape that you're, you're intimately familiar with and um, ultimately be interesting to hear your thoughts on this. So this concept of terrestrial resilience that the Nature Conservancy convened so many scientists to um, develop is based on two principles. And that is the fact that diverse features of a landscape plus the connectivity of those features are likely to preserve biodiversity into the future. So I know we've we've touched on this in a few different lectures at this point, but it's it's good to um, revisit the concept that's applied here, which is is preserving the stage and not the actors. And so rather than relying on knowledge about any focal species, this um, tool relies on some general principles of our understanding of organisms' willingness to um, move through natural habitats um, and also our understanding of features in a landscape that are likely to be barriers to movement generally without any one organism or even a suite of organisms being the, the focus of this analysis. It is a biodiversity focused analysis. Um, it really doesn't apply principles um, about human um, community resilience to climate change. And that's something that we have to remind folks that apply this model. So we've talked about this terrestrial resilience model before and the main tenets that TNC applied in their definition of um, of terrestrial resilience. Those two tenets are that um, we need landscape diversity, different soil types, different landforms in order to give various organisms options for movement locally. The second tenet is that we need those natural features within the landscape to be connected with natural covers that most organisms are willing to move between. So local diversity plus landscape scale connectivity or microhabitat connectivity uh, equal terrestrial resilience. In the notes, um, which I'll provide to you guys with these slides, I've copied in the long description of um, of the approach that the scientists took to looking at local connectivity. Looks at various land cover types and assigns resistance scores to those. And so um, this gives you a sense of the various resistance scores that were assigned. Um, there are certain <laughs> resistance scores, such as highly developed areas that are, that are the highest. And then expert opinion um, helped to generate resistance scores of other co cover types, basically based on just how natural or unnatural those cover types were. Um, I will say that there's been a little bit of controversy about this model in the Southeast because of the resistance that was applied to one ownership type to, to timber investment companies um, or timberlands within the landscape. Um, and that's been sort of an interesting thing to work through when, when we help groups such as land trusts think about applying this model to their work. So to generate connectedness measures um, for the terrestrial resilience model, they looked at um, 
local connectedness through a resistant kernel analysis. And since you guys already understand some of the elements of resistant kernel analysis, I won't go into a tremendous amount of detail, but it required um, that understanding of resistance within the landscape and some basic assumptions about all organisms willingness to move between natural cover types less natural cover types and then what serves as absolute um, barriers within the landscape so this screenshot is from um, the black river area as well and sort of captures the the fact that the riverine corridors offer some of the most diverse um, land features that we see and the most connected for natural cover and so therefore show up in the southeastern us where we don't have a ton of top topographic diversity um, as the most resilient features in the landscape So TNC's regional flow analysis captures a different type of connectivity. It's intended to capture the ability of organisms to persist on a longer time scale um, and actually move both latitudinally and um, in some cases upslope in order to escape the impacts of climate change. So in this case, TNC used that circuitscape model based on circuit theory. Um, the final map is really a wall-to-wall -wall grid where regional flow is applied um, and incorporates anthropogenic resistance features within the landscape. It gives us a sense at the much larger regional scale where we might see movement. Um, it gives us a sense of to what degree that movement is concentrated, um, where we have more dispersed flow because there are many different options for organisms to move across the landscape. So you can again go to the TNC tool and sort of look at regions that you know well um, and understand why they're at this regional scale, why we might see barriers to movement across the landscape. Again, this TNC model is unique because it's not considering any one type or suite of focal uh, organisms. And for that reason, they really had to incorporate pretty high, um, I guess I should say low threshold of resistance because we want to capture um, the movement of all types of organisms in this analysis. Because um, the regional flow analysis <clears throat> is built to help us understand the gradual movements of plants and animal populations in response to climate change. They did incorporate uh, weighted directional movement in the flow analysis. So the models um, allow for movement that are north-south and east-west directions with a preference for upslope movement and for northward migration of organisms. So as I mentioned, when we, we dig into the southeastern United States and look at where we see um, flows showing up, we see the important role that what we might call riparian climate corridors play um, as both connected and diverse features in the landscape. So riparian areas we know by definition are those floodplain zones along water bodies, um, they serve as an interface between terrestrial and aquatic e ecosystems and have showed up as some of the most important places that we can preserve and protect and restore in the southeastern United States. So when you look at TNC's regional connectivity tool, you'll see that we have three different types of flow addressed. And when you think about this from the circuit theory standpoint, um, areas where we have diffuse flow really are areas that are largely intact. They offer organisms lots of different options for movement. 
Um, they're important to protect. They might be areas that where we just want to see um, persistent management plans in place, broad scale um, conservation easements that keep these um, these areas in a natural condition, but they might not be our most pressing locations for, for land conservation. But in general, preserving diff diffuse flow areas across the landscape is an important priority. And, um, and again, it gives lots of different organisms options for movement that might be important um, in future climate scenarios. We can also look at the tool and see areas that are identified as concentration flow areas. These might be some of the most um, urgent for, for land conservation action. They might be places that we consider to acquire and fee for permanent land protection and management. Um, they are locations where the flow has been really constrained to a narrow, narrow area. They may represent some of the corridors on our landscape, um, but these concentrated flow areas give fewer options for organisms and might, might actually capture places that um, we have a lot of movement of, of organisms. And then we have areas in the landscape that are identified as areas of constrained flow. So these are areas that are imposing resistance within the landscape. They aren't providing those um, natural covers that organisms are going to flow, th flow through more easily. So these present a conservation challenge. They might be areas that we want to see restored or places where we might want to, even if we end up with um, concentrated flow, create some natural cover to connect other areas that have um, more sustained flow. So TNC actually did a separate analysis with their flow data where they looked at areas with really blocked flow, um, flow that would be hindered by major road crossings. Um, so in this analysis, you can see that They've looked at areas of concentrated flow, so some of those areas that would be most important for protection, and looked at where those intersected with major road crossings and found over 201 areas where major road crossings intersected with concentrated flow. Um, a lot of these road flow crossings were greatest in Pennsylvania, Florida, Georgia, Quebec. Um, and as you can imagine, this is an analysis that we could use to help us prioritize where we might want some significant road crossings um, for wildlife in the future. And our most recent um, Infrastructure and Investment and Jobs Act actually incorporates pretty significant funding for wildlife road crossings which is exciting to think about being able to apply this sort of um, analysis.